Hello, I'm hematologist oncologist Dr. Tony Talibi, and often prior to administration of chemotherapy, I order a port to be placed for my patients. Today I'm here with Dr. Jason Salsamendi, assistant professor of radiology, University of Miami, to explain exactly what a port is. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Would you please explain to our patients what is a port? A port is a good option for patients that need long-term intravenous access for whatever reason uh, over a, a period of months to years. And those patients that don't have suitable veins in the arms or legs or they need a medication in that area that could be harmful to those smaller veins, this is a great option. It's used for chemotherapy. It's also used for frequent blood draws if necessary. It's also used to administer other medications if patients don't, if, if patients that don't have uh, easy to find veins for the nurses or other practitioners. Mm -hmm. And is there a speci special procedure? How do you actually insert the port and where does it go? The port can be inserted by a surgeon or interventional radiologist, a physician trained in the techniques, uh, in the vascular techniques and, and, in, and the subcutaneous pocket technique. Uh, it goes most of the time just below the collarbone, usually at the site of vision for most patients. And there's a small catheter that connects it from the subcutaneous pocket in the upper chest, under the skin, into the central vein in the chest, usually through the jugular vein. And it sits there, and once the incision is healed over a couple of weeks, most patients can go back to completely normal activities, and they can use this port in the future for all their, their treatments there, until they finish their course of chemotherapy, or whatever course they may be on in their medical management. Mm -hmm. I see. So sometimes it looks like there's almost a coin underneath the skin. Yeah, so frequently it depends on the habits of the patient. Uh, some of the very thin body habits may be a little bit more protuberant. And those patients, we have slim ports that are lower profile mm -hmm. that are more suitable. And then for patients with a little bit more tissue in that area, we have larger ports mm -hmm. which allow the nurse to be able to palpate them so that they can easily access them. And uh, they're right under the skin surface in all circumstances, and they're easily accessible. Initially, it may be a little bit painful for the patient, like a pinch, but definitely less painful than having an IV. And with time, it may be a little bit numb in that area, and it'll be easily tolerated. We use a specific needle to access the port, and it has to be by somebody, a physician or staff member that's trained in accessing the port. The needle has a 90 degree bevel, it's called the Huber needle. Right. And that needle is the only one that should be used to access a port to maintain the quality of the diaphragm of the port. Other needles can tear away the silicon diaphragm. How long can the port actually stay in the body? I've had patients for many years with the port. The FDA does have a certain number of accesses that the port can, um, how many accesses the port can uh, be used for. Mm -hmm. uh, but we don't get anywhere near that with oh. our treatments. Uh, but my thinking is, once the chemotherapy regimen is done and they no longer need the intravenous access, it's a foreign body and we should remove it as soon as they don't need that metaport there. So you can easily remove it yourself? It's removed easily, not like a pick line that can be just pulled out in a second. However, it can be removed easily with just general, like, just lidocaine to the surface and maybe a little bit of conscious sedation and with the local anesthesia and just a little dissection and small suturing and it's out within maybe 15 minutes. I see. What should the patient do the night before in the morning of the procedure? The night before a, a metaport placement, we ask them to refrain from eating after midnight. And again, they review all the medications that they're taking to make sure that they, we prevent the allergic reaction or some kind of cross-reaction with the medications that we give. And we also want to make sure that their blood tests that are satisfactory, that they don't have any bleeding during the procedure or afterwards, or medications that they're taking. Make sure that the medications they're taking don't put them at a higher risk of bleeding during the procedure. That's it. If the patient has any allergies, does that alter the procedure at all? Uh, we do get prophylactic antibiotics during the procedure. And so if they have a penicillin allergy, we may have to may change our prophylactic antibiotic to something else with the same coverage. So it does have some effect but usually not such that it would prevent us from being able to replace the metaphor. How soon after the procedure can a patient take a shower and wash that area? There may be some variance and recommendations from institution to institution, but the basic message is that area needs to be dry. Uh, I prefer, and my colleagues prefer, to have this area dry for three days mm -hmm. to allow for satisfactory healing. Some institutions also apply on top of the 
the suturing uh, stereo strips, which last for about 14 days, and they start falling off on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, so I prefer to have a bandage over that area for three days. And then after three days, that bandage can come off, and then the underlying stereo strips or dermabond, which is another adhesive, will be present, and that will start falling off about 10 to 14 days That's from the sweet. procedure. And also during that time period, other things that the patient should be aware of is uh, preventing from significant strenuous exercise that would put tension along this, the suture line that would prevent proper healing. Uh, we also let them know about uh, areas of what they see areas of redness or increasing pain or they have chills or fever that could be signs of a complication that if we pick up early we could address it possibly antibiotics before we need to do anything like removing a port infection. Mm -hmm. I see, so basically any pain out of contr out of normal or fever that should prompt right. investigation. A typical patient with a metaphor has some degree of pain that can be controlled with Tylenol for the first 24 to 48 yeah. hours. After that the pain should mostly if not all subside. Is there someone who would not be a candidate for this procedure? Now, fortunately, with some patients with chronic diseases where they've had already multiple access sites, they don't have central veins that we can access. We have to place a metaport maybe in a different position. There are some metaports we place in a translumbar fraction from the vein that from the drains of the lower abdomen. Wow. Or controversial, there's other areas that we can place a metaport. Uh, and there, there's patients that are not good wound healers and maybe on medications like Avastin, which could delay wound healing and we may want to time that treatment with the mm -hmm. metaphor sure. placement. And uh, lastly, patients that are unfortunately in, maybe in the hospital and they have some underlying illness and they have what we call bacteremia or some present infection that needs to clear. And once it's cleared, they can be candidates for a metaphor. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been educational.